Scott, we can't thank you enough for being here today. It's a pleasure, and what a wonderful break from the weather to be here at the uh, the winter the winter meeting for uh, <laughs> Purdue. Absolutely, great time. So, tell us about your journey at Purdue. Uh, you're from Van Wert, Ohio. Yes. How did you find out about Purdue? What was far, your first far memory? boy from Van Wert? <laughs> At the time, well, I knew from the time I was a little kid that I wanted to be a pilot, went through building model airplanes and remote control airplanes, and was able to solo at the local airport on my 16th birthday and get my private license on my 17th birthday, which is the youngest you can do that. And Purdue at the time was the only school in the country that had a four-year degree in aviation technology. And they were the only university in the world to have a supplemental or a charter airline. And so all the team sports were carried on uh, Purdue airplanes. And that was part of the training program at the, the university level, the first year was traditional courses, math and science and English and speech and all of that. But then everything else was at, at the airport and you were being trained uh, at the airline to be co a co-pilot on back then, I'm gonna date myself, <laughs> 1968. <laughs> DC-3s, which exist primarily in museums these days, <laughs> and four-engine DC-6s. And then the year I graduated, unfortunately for me, they moved to a jet fleet of DC-9s. And those were all passenger airplanes, and team sports and military uh, called CAMS, Civil Air Movements for the Military. It was an awesome program. And again, there wasn't anything like it in the world. And um, it certainly was by the grace of God that I was accepted to Purdue. It wasn't my transcript in high school because I was always looking out the window in high school wanting to be at the airport. <laughs> and so, you know, one size does not fit all in education. I spent a lot of time in K through 12 with our foundation trying to improve uh, public education in my found home of Tennessee, Greenville, Tennessee. But the experience at Purdue was just absolutely amazing. And again, it was one of a kind. It was a preeminent program in the world, and it's still a pretty good program. <laughs> it sure is. So tell us, you know, a favorite story or memory. You know, you're always at that Purdue airport. What's, what's something that really stands out to you as a student? Oh gosh, I'm, I'm not sure I should tell this one because <laughs> it, it is the first one that came to mind. <laughs> so <clears throat> in the summertime, the, we would take the DC-3s and they had lined up charters all summer long from Minneapolis to take fishermen, sportsmen, up into almost the edge of the Arctic Circle, way up into Canada, a place called Reindeer Lake that had a 3,000 foot uh, gravel strip and a DC-3 with 24 passengers could land on that gravel strip. Well, I was one of the first ones to go from my class up there and you did it two weeks at a time and it was wonderful. It was wonderful. The fishing was great. <laughs> and it didn't hurt that the lodge was staffed by co-eds from the University of Saskatchewan. When I got up there and kind of fell in love with it, <laughs> I came back and I, I told my roommate, I'm like, man, you do not want to go up there. The mosquitoes will carry you out of that place. You really don't want to go. And so I talked him in to not taking that rotation so I could go back <laughs> up and uh, continue my flying experience and maybe other experiences as well. <laughs> Certainly fishing. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, that's the first one that no, came to mind. <laughs> you gotta go with your gut and share that one. 
So but, do you have any professors mm, or mentors within your time at Purdue that oh, you really look up to? Yes. I, I'm so glad you asked me that question. Um, the chairman of the Professional Pilot Technology Program was a wonderful man by the name of Charles Holloman, Charlie Ho Professor Holloman. And I'd been there the first semester and the, there were only like 16 in my class. So we got to know him very well. And I was homesick, girlfriend was in Ohio. Here I am, 18 years old at, at Purdue, which was a big campus then, mm -hmm. but only half as big as it is today. <laughs> it felt really big to me then. And um, I, I wanted to go home, and I told him that. And so we sat down in his office one evening, and he convinced me that I needed to stay and see this program through. And because of him, I stayed with this program that in retrospect was absolutely an elite, elite program. And I'm so thankful for him. And he, at I believe 91 or 92, this past fall was inducted into the Indiana Aviation Hall of Fame. And I got to go to that event. Oh. And once again, thank him for everything that he had meant to me. And um, w without him, I would not have continued the program. But um, that wasn't uncommon then for professors to be that close and that helpful mm -hmm. and very interested in their student. And that continues today, regardless of the number of students. Purdue is exceptional because of the staff and faculty that they have there in caring for the student. What would you say, you know, if, if you hadn't followed through with Purdue and had gone back to Ohio, you know, there's all these things that aligned, right, and, and yep. happened after you graduated. What, looking back, you know, what did, what is, what did Purdue mean to your, to your life and after your graduation? Well, I need to continue a little bit of the first, I guess, the first question. But because they were a supplemental airline, it was your curriculum was really applied science in every sense of the word. You got to work in operations of the airline, you got to work in weather, you got to work in dispatch. I got to see all of that. Mm -hmm. And I'll bring you back, and I'll, I'll tie that one off in a minute. But had it not been for the Purdue education, uh, I'd have been a very happy pilot for some corporation or some airline for the balance of my life from that point forward. But because of that experience that I just told you about, after I had accepted a job with the Magnavox company flying a corporate airplane that was based in Tennessee, they asked me to start a freight service with a small freighter. And that led to the creation of a of an, a cargo airline with big airplanes called General Aviation. And we had 38 big airplanes flying every night in scheduled service. But had it not been for Purdue and the experience of everything I learned through that airline, I would never have known how to get started and start my own cargo airline. So that was kind of a, kind of a one-off that that, that was able to happen, we sold that to a public company, the Cargo Airline, mm -hmm. about 10 years in, just as trucking was deregulated. And when trucking was deregulated, that meant you could move m multiple types of, of cargo, commodities, between any two city pairs. Before that, it was very, very, very regulated. And so a lot of those small routes from Charlotte to Indianapolis to Chicago, we could take trucks and make that same service overnight. Mm. And that began a company called Landair, which we took public. Okay. Forever changed my life on, um, let's see, the week before Thanksgiving, 1993. And then in 98, 
we took the second company that would specify that just did air cargo for the major airlines of the world, over a hundred of the airlines of the world, moving the freight from a gateway to the interior of the United States, we called that Deliver America. And we took forward air public. And so from that very humble beginning where we put $2,500 into a bank account to, to pay for the gas for the first truck, uh, we took those public, and today the sales are about, of those two companies, about 2.2 billion. And I signed my, a lot of personal endorsements, but $2,500 <laughs> uh, was all we ever uh, put into it. And um, Forward Air, we, we converted Land Air to a more philanthropic endeavor where the free cash flow from land air we were able to create in this belt of Appalachia, Greenville, Tennessee, where I live, which borders western North Carolina, eastern Kentucky, and southwest Virginia, go into these rural, very small public schools, and put in math and science programs, and, in the, the, and this has grown now. That has enabled us to we're over 500 high schools. We're in every high school in Tennessee teaching online AP STEM coursework, 19 of them. But you can actually get college credits for all of those if you sc score high, high enough. So the foundation is now in every public high school in the state of Tennessee. Um, and this creation of these companies enable that to happen. And I'm still sitting on the, for, uh, the board of, of Forward Air, okay. which is based in this little town in um, 250 or 300 corporate employees, and Land Air has 150 corporate employees. And that makes a difference. It doesn't make a difference in a city like Indianapolis or Chicago or Atlanta, mm -hmm. but those kind of jobs in a town of 20,000 people really make a difference. And so, if it all ends today, it's been a beautiful ride. None of it would have been possible without Purdue University, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> you know, you talked about bringing STEM courses to, to these public schools in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Why was that so important for you? Did you have that, that type of coursework in Ohio, for example, before you got to Purdue? That's a great question. <laughs> The first place I saw online coursework was at Purdue University, and this would have been t over 20 years ago. Okay. And the foundation is just 20 years old this past year. And there was a class, a technology class, working with online, live time, with a class in Stuttgart, Germany. And I'm like, wow. That's really the future of how you can deliver excellent coursework at a very affordable price. And when you're representing, in, in our region, we have one high school called Clinch on the Kentucky-Tennessee border that has just 53 to 56 students a year in the entire uh, high school. They're too far to bus to Omega School. And so through online learning, they have a number of AP courses available to them. Uh, we put math and science labs in. And um, so they have the ability now to go on to higher education and have had the same sort of rigorous coursework that you might have in a high school with 1,200 people sure. that can afford the on-site teacher. Sure, that's incredible. Gosh, did I answer the question? <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> now, you, you, you told me a little bit about this story last night, but I, I want all of our listeners to hear it too. So you've, with your foundation, donated to create a children's hospital in Tennessee. Tell us about, about that story and you know, why you were so passionate about that. If, oh, gosh. You've got to make me emotional with <laughs> this one. So w part of our foundation work, the Nicewanger Foundation, is also taking young people from that region who have expressed uh, uh, an interest in, in getting higher ed, 
returning in some specialty, and we'll send them to the best school in America. And we've had three of them at Purdue, I might add. <laughs> one more, one more. But one of those that we had accepted was diagnosed with cancer and had to go to St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And um, the family was forever split up because of that. They stayed in a room. The mom had to quit her job. They lived in a Ronald McDonald house in Memphis for almost 17 months. And the good news is, child's cancer free to this day. But I was saying to our director of the foundation at the time, I'm like, Buzz, how can we get better health care for the people, the children of our region? If you drew a hundred mile circle around there, you'd have over a million people. And I've forgotten how many, tens of thousands of children, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so I just called the local hospital and they said, you know, we've been trying to build a freestanding children's hospital, but we just, we can't fund it. And so in conjunction with East Tennessee State University, where there are several Purdue people, I might add, on faculty, they have a medical center and a pharmacy school. And so uh, in conjunction with them, I said, I'll build the hospital uh, for our, our children if we can get a St. Jude's clinic and at that time, there were six or seven, there may be seven or eight or nine today. And um, so they said, well, we're not sure that's possible because we're on this end of Tennessee. St. Jude's is on the other end of Tennessee. So I went to a man by the name of Bill Evans, who was at the time, he's still at St. Jude's as far as I know, but uh, he was the CEO. And um, he was, uh, again, because the mothership is in Memphis, the other end of Tennessee. He wasn't, he didn't think that that would work. But uh, I guess a God moment occurred here. And um, we were, I explained to him that if you turn Tennessee north and south, we're 30 miles closer in eastern Tennessee, we're 30 miles closer to Windsor, Ontario, Canada, than we are Memphis. It's 500 miles to Memphis. <laughs> And um, he took note of that. And um, I just asked him to take, then take it to his board, and as did several other people involved from ETSU. And long story short, uh, the God moment occurred, and Bill called and said, we're gonna do this. We are gonna put the seventh affiliate clinic of St. Jude's in Eastern Tennessee. And so today, um, our children, and the one other thing I said to Bill was, what I'd really like for you to consider and your board to consider is that the children of Eastern Tennessee, Western North Carolina, Eastern Kentucky, Southwestern Virginia, can have the same health care. is the children in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And so it happened, and we're getting ready to double. That was 10 or 12 years ago. We're getting ready to double the size of the children's hospital this fall. What did you feel like when you got that phone call? <laughs> I think you may have just noticed my expression, uh -huh. and it was all up like that. Mm -hmm. It was... Uh, a divine moment, to say the least, that that was going to occur, and that that began that project right then. That's incredible. It really is. <laughs> now you're an entrepreneur. You've you've served on in all different types of business capacities. You've had a very successful career. Are there any challenges that you had to overcome throughout your years? <laughs> I'm sure there have been. <laughs> but how did you overcome those challenges? Well, you hear this a lot. It may be an overused phrase, but I truly mean this. Whatever success I've had, I owe in large part to others. Mm -hmm. And it was being able to bring people to the dream and say, we can do this and have them buy into the dream that we're much more capable 
at a particular skill set within a business than I was. I'm a pretty good generalist, <laughs> know a little bit about most everything, but not a lot about accounting and finance. And, and uh, um, so we were able to put together this wonderful team of people that allowed us to take two, two companies public uh, with 2,500 bucks invested. <laughs> Anyhow, so. Uh, so you're here, you know, in Naples for, for the President's Council and you're still involved with Purdue Aviation. I can tell how much you love Purdue. What is, <laughs> what is being part of this community and this family mean to you? Well, it's, uh, it's something that I'll take with me forever and for the university to allow me to continue to be involved is um, it, it just amazing and, and things that we're accomplishing up there again and who knows we may uh, like the movie title Back to the Future we, maybe we can get back to the future where we've got bigger aircraft that can move the teams around and, and do that internally and, and like my class, get the experience of actual, actual learning mm -hmm, or applied thing. science mm -hmm. and how an airline works. And do you have any favorite Purdue traditions? <laughs> <laughs> traditions. Like watching games or tail, do you oh. ever go back to tailgate? Well, we, I don't get to come up too often. Okay. But I get to one or two football games and um, going to Maryland, this, uh, to the Maryland game, when we take a group back up in, in my plane to, okay. uh, to Lafayette on Sunday, going to go to the Maryland game. And then I'm trying to get grandson number three. I've had two grandsons that went through the sales and, and marketing major at, at Purdue who are doing pretty good. <laughs> and so I'm trying to get number three of eight. I hope I'm here to see all of them. A couple of them are pretty small. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take him to the Indiana game and, and, and get him in there and see if he can't catch the boiler up spirits. I think that's a perfect game to take him to, to expose it's him to the, that. It's the one where it would be the craziest. Yes. And I think he'll enjoy that. What does, you know, you said, you just said two grandsons went to Purdue. What is, what does this mean to your family and, and just, you know, everything that Purdue has given to you over the years and now given to your grandsons? Well, yeah, I'm trying to give it back. And um, I, um, I tell my, tell my children <laughs> that I don't want to deprive them of understanding the joy of working for a living and the self-esteem that that will bring to them mm -hmm. by doing their own thing. For, uh, we have four children, and three of them are, are in education and teachers. And um, um, so you can't take it with you. And so without Purdue, none of this would have been possible. I mean that very sincerely. It would not have been possible. And so to be participating in Purdue Aviation and giving back to the program that really set me up for success is where I want to spend my time. That and then K through 12 education and making sure that, that kids have a purpose when they come out. Yeah, do you have any stories to expand on that of, of a student who you know, went through because of your program and is now a pilot or an engineer or any type of STEM-related career? I have 101 <laughs> okay. of stories. Of We have a, 101 scholars that have either completed the program, I guess we have maybe 20 that are in universities now across the country. Uh, that have been wildly successful. And it isn't about um, what they make, it's about having the heart and the passion for what they want to do. And we've had a lot of great educators, we've got a lot of great doctors that have come out, the head of the radiology department who <laughs> did an MRI on me last year. This was really, <laughs> full circle, oh, right. to have him, the head of radiology, is one of our, 
one of our scholarship students. But it's more than the money. It's a leadership training program where each summer we have the kids for two weeks and we bring in leaders in business, education, government to um, meet with them. As a matter of fact, we have Mitch Daniels coming this summer Wonderful. to talk to the talk to the 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 alums will come back for that and the ones in the current program talk about um, politics mm -hmm. and um, and what he has seen as governor and um, so it's a leadership training program as much as anything the capstone of that is the last thing I want these young people to see is Normandy so we take our plane and we go from Little Greenville, Tennessee, seven hours and 25 minutes later, they wake up and we're in London, okay. England. <laughs> we do the Churchill bunker. We do everything, uh, spend a couple of, of days there and nights, channel to Paris, spend a night there. But the rest of the time, we're out in the, the, the farms of Normandy, and we have a guide that we've worked with for years that lives there to tell them about the World War II experience. And when you see, and they're not being taught that today. Mm -hmm. And when you see these young people for the first time look out over, over 10,000 graves with young people who are younger, most of them younger than they are, mm -hmm. laying there in the field, um, it, it's impactful. That freedom is not free, and, um, and they're not learning much about that. So we give them a little Ohio flag to represent where I grew up, and a Tennessee flag, pencil and tracing pad. We say, now go find someone from Tennessee on those markers and someone from Ohio. And they'll trace the names and everything and with today's internet capabilities, mm -hmm. then we have them look up who these young people were and where they were from, and um, it's impactful. But they learn the responsibility and what it took from those that have gone before them for them to be able to enjoy today's freedom. Sure, that's a really unique experience for them. It is. It really is. Is there anything, when you look back, that you would have done differently as a student? <laughs> <laughs> I'd have worked harder than I, than, I worked, than, I, than I worked. The only part I really wanted, let's go fly. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would have focused a little, a little bit more, but at that age, we've all been there. Uh, you gotta have some fun too. <laughs> you turned out okay. No, it, it worked out. <laughs> when you look back too, it's it's really unique that you've wanted to be a pilot since you were a little. Yeah, so about twelve years old, and um, riding the tricycle in your hometown was in the flight path. Fort Wayne, Bear Field was in the flight path right over my home, and I'd see those airplanes letting down and. I, I want to do that, so I started building model airplanes. And then my aunt gave me, for my 12th birthday, $25 to go to the airport and take a, uh, an introductory ride. Well, back then it was just five or six bucks. <laughs> so, and a little two-seater Aronka champ. Oh. And um, so I did that and that was it. <laughs> I knew for sure that's what I wanted to do. So I was, my mom always, if she couldn't find me, she just called the airport because she knew that's where I was. And I'd wash airplanes, wax airplanes, sweep the floor, anything to get the next flying lesson. And so I had uh, scads of time. Back then you'd have 40 hours to get, uh, to get a private license. I don't know how much time I had because I'd worked <laughs> at the airport but um, was able to get that solo on my 16th birthday. And then, as I said, got my uh, 
private. And I've been telling this story for so, so long, I told one of my classmates, who, Jim Rice, who lives in Dallas and, and was went through the program, okay. went to Magnavox, went into the Air Force in the Air Guard unit in Fort Wayne, where his father had flown, and became the chief pilot of Southwest Airlines. Wow. And retired just a few years ago. I said, Jim, I've been telling this story about soloing on my 16th birthday, my private on the 17th, and I got weathered out on my 18th birthday to get my commercial for so long. I'm not sure it's true. <laughs> and so <laughs> I found my original logbook, and uh, I was uh, relieved to find out the story I'd been telling for 50, 60 <laughs> years is in fact true. <laughs> was that really helpful for you to have that before you got to Purdue? Were your classmates kind of intimidated? In, in, uh, no, in professional pilot technology, you had to come with, I believe you had to come with a commercial license okay. or get it in the first year you were there. And, uh, and that was part of that program. And then about that same time, they then began taking, we call it zero to hero, uh, young people with no flight experience at all and take them all the way through what I've just described to you at the university in, in a four year, then in a four year program. We talked about this a little bit, but why is it important to you to stay so involved with Purdue and with the aviation program? Well, first of all, I love aviation. <laughs> I can't tell. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I'll try not to hide it. But, um, and to just be around young, the young people, you know, I was once there. Mm -hmm. And so to any extent that I, I can help them overcome some possible mistakes or things I would have done differently, uh, just to be around them. It just keeps me young, it keeps me invigorated. I don't ever want to stop. What does the the Boilermaker spirit mean to you when you're going to that Purdue IU game it, with your grandson? What are, what are you gonna feel like? I'll be very emotional like everyone else, else there. But you know, the dinner that we're going to have tomorrow night where we have, in my opinion, the best leader in higher education in certainly in the country, the world, <laughs> the world. And um, everything Purdue does is done well or they won't do it. Mm -hmm. and the other activity I have, fortunate enough to participate in at Purdue, is the Purdue Research Foundation, which has 20 or 25 startup companies coming out of the university every year have created thousands of jobs for Indiana kids and, and kids all over the world. But being able to participate in that um, is truly an honor for me. And so having tried to learn as much as I could in my region at ETSU, East Tennessee State University, we have created the ETSU Research Corporation. Well, as you might imagine, it pretty much mirrors a university about 350 miles to the northwest. <laughs> and so I've been able to bring a lot of the things that I've been continuing education. You know, four years, you're not done. That's just the beginning. Right. And so that my continuing education is through working with a wonderful board members. Brian Edelman, wonderful leadership. Dan Hassler, before him, leading that program that is just world class. So I've taken a few of those things, a few of my notes back to Tennessee <laughs> and say, here's what we need to do to create 21st century jobs in our region. We suffered heavily at NAFTA. When NAFTA occurred, Ross Perot was right when he said that giant sucking sound you hear will be jobs moving to Mexico. Well, that was the first step, and then to Asia. We lost all the, Magnavox had 3,200 employees in a town of 10,000 people, so labor was important. Mm -hmm. We had a half a dozen furniture companies, Asia. We lost all of that. Uh, 
we were uh, the largest dairy producing county in Greene County, uh, Tennessee, in, uh, in Tennessee. That all disappeared to mega farms in Ohio. A lot of our milk come, <laughs> comes uh, on the store shelf, comes from Texas, and, w and one dairy in Chattanooga. But we went from 110 small dairy farms, which made great employees for all the manufacturing base, to now we're down to under 10 dairies in, in this lush green county of 600 square miles right at the foot of the mountains. And so um, being able to go from 20% unemployment through having great leadership at my companies that allowed me to spend a lot of time in economic development, um, it's made a difference where we're about the national average for un unemployment now. But the type of jobs we had to completely retool for something that wasn't just assembly work. And now we're fo really focused with the additions to the hospital and the medical school at ETSU to medical devices, mm -hmm. startups, research docs, bringing them to the region. It'll take a couple of decades, sure. but we're changing those jobs to very high technology jobs within the region. Again, I go back to Purdue. <laughs> I saw it there, and I see it every time I go to a PRF board meeting, mm -hmm. and I remember what really worked, and I take it back home, and we apply it to rural East Tennessee. What did, you've done so much for that, that area. You've really impacted a lot of families, I'm sure. What, what does that mean to you? Well, having seen this in, uh, in the, and what can be, led me to how can I how can I help? Whether it's helping city government in a redevelopment project of our downtown, being able to contribute to the medical facilities there. Um, and our school system there are 146 school systems in Tennessee. Okay. And Greenville City Schools is either depending on the year, one, two or three in the state of Tennessee. And one year, very recently, they actually beat Oak Ridge. Well, Oak Ridge schools, uh, that area has more PhDs per capita than any county in America because of the Oak Ridge National Labs. And so to see our school systems being lifted up are kids having the rigorous coursework it takes to be successful at higher education has been tremendously rewarding for me. And, um, and the community has been accepting of that. And um, it's just been a wonderful place to live and work and raise our family. You touched on President Daniels a bit ago. What, what do you think his leadership, how do you think that's impacted Purdue? <laughs> Oh, where do you start? Where do you start? <laughs> I first, before I answer that, I just the thought that came to my mind was I just uh, saw his uh, commencement address in May, where he comes in on the motorized couch. <laughs> yeah. to, uh, the couch car. Here, you know, here, I mean, most people at that level take themselves way too seriously. Yep, yep, yep. They forget that everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time <laughs> in the morning, but he doesn't. But um, to have some, if you read his book, to have someone of his intellect and his background and business acumen mm -hmm. through um, Lilly, yeah. state government, federal government, be able to bring that all in at the university level. Uh, there were those that were skeptical at first, and no one's skeptical anymore. And um, you don't see many presidents of higher ed on CNBC, mm -mm. but you see him, mm -hmm. and he's well respected in uh, not only higher ed, but in every business circle that I know of. They know who Mitch Daniels is. Yeah. And I couldn't be prouder. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to share with our listeners? I think you've about worn me out. <laughs>
I did not mean to wear you out, let me tell you. No, I think you probably got more out of me than you should have. <laughs> <laughs> well, we so much appreciate your time and we love talking to you and hearing all your stories. Yeah, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you.